Shall we pray this morning? Father God, we are so thankful for your continued blessings, Lord. Father, as we begin our service this morning in terms of your word, Father, we pray that you will speak from on high to our hearts and our minds. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before I begin, I have to remind you that on the 23rd of this month, we will not be here. We will be having Global Youth Day. We are in the month of serve in our Connect, Grow, Serve, Go. And so we are going to be joining young people all over the world as we celebrate Global Youth Day and we serve our community. So... Florida Conference has the registration open now. If you would like to get a t-shirt that says adopt, because the, the theme for this year is adopt something. And so this year we're going to adopt two different communities. One is going to be in the A. Philip Randolph area. The second is going to be in the Arlington area. So we are adopting a community, And so we are going to find ways that we can better our community. And we're going to join the other three Florida Conference churches here in Jacksonville. And we're going to do this as a group of Adventists here in Jacksonville. Amen? So we need you to go to the Florida Conference website and register. Because if you register, you can purchase a t-shirt that says Adopt Florida. And it will have, uh, on the back, it will say Global Youth Day. And also, if you'd like us to provide you lunch that day while we're serving, that is available as well. But we need you to register. FloridaConference.com and register for Global Youth Day. Yes. The 23rd, we're not going to be there. There will be no church services in any of the churches. We are going to be out serving in the community. Yeah, we're moving that. So we'll have to make a change there. But with that being said, we want all of you to participate. I was told the definition of a young person is anybody under 100. If you're under 100, you're considered a youth. If you're over 100, well, then you can be old. We'll, we'll, we'll let you go on that one. But we want everybody serving and we want to be a blessing to the community of Jacksonville. And so we have a family fun day planned for the community. We're going to be inviting people to come out. There'll be inflatables. There'll be activities. There'll be all kinds of things. There'll be areas to serve, areas to cook, areas to do, whatever. Whatever God has gifted you in, we will find you something to use it for. Amen? Amen. So we want you to serve. Also, I have one more announcement that didn't make it this morning. Men, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you know where Bay Meadows Road is. Okay? Men, if you know where Bay Meadows Road is, raise your hand if you know where Denny's is on Bay Meadows Road. Bay Meadows Road, 95. There is a Denny's. We are going to have a men's night twice a month. We want to invite you out. We want you to come. We're going to have a spiritual thought and then some fellowship together. If you'd like to buy dinner for yourself, you're welcome to do that. But we want to start meeting two Wednesdays out of the month right there at Bay Meadows Road and 95 at Denny's at 7 p.m. The first one is this upcoming Wednesday. So we want to invite you out as part of men's ministry. All right, so today, because our topic is serving, and we're talking about serving, we should probably talk about serving, amen? Amen. Does that make sense? Does that follow that logic? So here's what's interesting. When we talk about serving, when we talk about these different things, we have to understand that serving is something that starts... At home. You know, I was thinking about... Somebody once asked me the question, why are you still in church? 
Because as you know, there's statistics that talk about young people and especially young people my age. Why are you still in church? What did somebody do differently? They asked me this question one time. And I I really had to think about it. I didn't have a firm answer for it. Uh, Because I can go to my Facebook page and I can show you probably easily 350 people who grew, I grew up with, I went to camp meeting with, I went, that went to other churches that I knew that I was connected with, that the moment that they hit college, they walked away and haven't been back to church since. I can go to my Facebook and find hundreds of them. As I'm sure anybody under the age of 30 who's sitting in this room has those friends that they grew up with, they went to church with, but no longer go. And so one of the things that I thought about was what was it that kept me in church? And then I thought about my parents. I am so thankful for my parents. I don't think I say that enough. Uh, Because I had godly parents. I have parents that were involved in church. I mean, when I say involved, I mean like involved, involved, okay? Not like we just showed up every Saturday. I was there Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe got Thursday off and was definitely there Friday. Besides the pastor's children, I did not grow up as a, as a PK. I think I would be even worse. Pray for my child, please. Uh, I didn't grow up as a pastor's child, but I did grow up as a head elder's child, which meant that if the church doors were open, we were there. And so, but, but that wasn't the thing that kept me in church. What I remember the most is watching my father as he took us to serve people in our community. Because when Christmas time came, And food baskets were being handed out. My father grabbed me, my brother, and my sister. And we all loaded up in the van. And we drove to people's houses to drop off food baskets for people. When the church had an activity and there was a project that needed to be done. My dad packed up the car. My mom packed up the car. We got in the car. We drove there. And we did what God called us to do. I remember one time, I spent so much time at church, I told my dad, I don't want to ever see church again. But my dad saw that serving people was something that was important. It was a value that he wanted to instill in his children. So every opportunity that he had, he took us along to show us what to do. You know, a lot of times we talk about teaching techniques, and I've got several teachers in the room. One of the best ways to teach somebody is to model a behavior. If you want your child or you want your family to be focused on service, you yourself have to be focused on service. Because you can't be, do as I say, not as I do. It just doesn't work. Sooner or later, somebody, and especially your teenagers, will call you on your hypocrisy. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? You want me to serve, but you yourself aren't serving. It's interesting. I went to a training, and we're going to have this training here later on in the year, called A New Kind of Leader. Anybody heard of it? If you haven't, you will hear of it shortly, especially when our church as a whole goes through the training. And one of the things that they said in this training was simply this. Just because you believe something doesn't really matter. Okay, so let me ask you a question. How many people here think kids matter? Would you if you if you if I said that statement, you would agree with it. All right, let me ask you a question a little further. How many of you believe that kids matter more than adults? All my kids are raising in the back there. 
So let me ask you a question. If that's the case, why then when we finished our nominated committee were the only things that were open and available children's spots? So here's the thing. It's not a matter of what you believe. It's a matter of what you do with what you believe. Let me say that again. It's not a matter of what you believe. It's what you do with what you believe. There are plenty of churches across the United States that have believed the truth, that have come to an understanding of the gospel, who know all of these different things, but they still close their doors. Why? Because there has to be a move from belief to doing, to action. If there isn't, then what you have is at best information. Without the doing, you don't have the power, the transforming, incredible power of the Holy Spirit working in a world that desperately needs Jesus. What you have is good information at best. So what has to happen is you have to move from believing. Like I said, how many of you said that I believe that young people matter, that kids matter? If you believe that, that should change the way that you do things. It should change the way that your focus is. It should change the way that your budget in your church works. I didn't get a couple of amens on that one. If we're saying that, anybody ever invest money? Anybody ever invested money? Hopefully you are saving for your retirement. Which is better? To invest your money in the beginning of your work time or the end? Why? The sooner that you invest in something, the bigger the returns are. The sooner that you invest in our children, the bigger the returns are. I don't know how many parents I know that have said, I wish I had started sooner with my children. I've heard a lot of parents that said that. So this morning I want to teach you a principle and it's found in Matthew chapter 25. If you have your Bibles with you, open it up. And we're going to talk about what it looks like to live a life of service. For those of you who don't know, yesterday we had a community service day here. We had hundreds of people that came through these doors. We had people that came and gave free haircuts. Almost 35 haircuts were given yesterday. Amen. Uh, almost 600 people total served. We had 51 volunteers. How many of you even knew that that happened? A few? There's a few. Here's what it says. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, that's an incredible day, is it not? When the Son of Man comes. It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. And it says, all nations will be gathered before Him. How many nations? Okay. If all nations, what does that mean? Are we part of a nation? So therefore, I can make the assumption if it's all nations, that it's all people as well. This isn't just some people. This isn't just good people. This isn't just bad people. This is all people. Whether they're church folk or not. Believer or unbeliever. The Bible says that all nations will be brought before him. And so we see... That, that Jesus is sitting upon this throne, that the heavenly father is there. And it says, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. When you separate something, what does that usually mean? 
if I'm separating some, if I was, if I was going to take this entire group and I said, okay, you're over here and you're over here and we divided up the whole room, what does that usually mean when I separate something? There, there's something different about these two groups of people. I'm separating them because there's something that is unique about one versus the other. Um, I saw a show once where they put coworkers' names on a list. And they just drew a line down the middle of the, the, the page and there was names on either side. And they were trying to figure out based on what it was, what the list was, what it meant. So here we have these two groups that were separated out. They, they, they're, they're one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Well, we talked a little bit about it. What, which one would you rather be? Would you rather be a sheep or a goat? Okay, so we understand that there is both positive and negative here in this, in this passage. Because we know that it's good to be a sheep... And not a good thing to be a goat. We, we've come to understand that. I don't know why goats get such a bad rep, but I'm just saying. In scripture, we know that sheep are good and goats are bad. So. And it says, and he will set the sheep on his right hand. Now again, how many people know that the right hand is a good place to be? According to scripture, if you're set on the right hand, that's a good place to be. If you're on the left, guess what? Not so great. But here we see, it says that he shall put the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's something I want to hear someday. What about you? Come inherit the kingdom which God has prepared for you. That's almost as good as well done, good and faithful servant. Either one of those I would be happy to hear. However, it goes on to say, for I was hungry and you gave me food. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Now, I want you to pay attention real quick, this next verse. It says... Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? When did this happen? You know, it's interesting. Here God is giving this incredible message of what they did. And the people that did it are sitting there going, when did this happen? When did this occur? What, what are you talking about? You know, it's interesting. When service becomes part of your DNA, you do it without even knowing. Let me say that again. When service becomes part of your DNA or the DNA of your family, you do it without even knowing that you're doing it. They didn't say, well, sister so-and-so, don't you remember last week we went to the, we went to the uh, homeless shelter and when we fed people, we do that every month. Jesus must have been in the line then. No, because what happens is when you create service as part of your DNA for your family, what happens is you end up serving people that you work with. Amen. You end up serving people in your neighborhood. You end up serving the neighbor who lives upstairs from you. 
You end up loving people with an unconditional love. It just because of what Jesus means to you, you are called to serve other people. This is something that becomes of who you are and what you do. So for me, because of what my father did 30 years ago, it is way easier for me to love people. It is way easier for me to serve people. It is way easier for me to be able to look at somebody in need and say, you know what? I need to stop and help that person. Why? Because it took someone investing in the idea and the concept that my family will serve. You know, this is something that we need to invest in our children. We need to invest in our grandchildren. Our nieces, our nephews, the kid that you watch at your house, it doesn't matter. Teach them to serve and love other people. Because the Bible says that they will know you by your love. Like I said, we've heard this passage of scripture before. It's possible to sit in this church and to hear these messages and go home and do absolutely nothing about it. You can. You can come here every week for the next 30 years. Lord, I hope we're not here for 30 more years. But at the same time, it doesn't mean a thing. Because sooner or later, there will be a separation of the sheep and the goats. Because if you remember, up until the point that the king comes... The sheep and the goats are together. So understand that it is possible to hear but not understand. It is possible to hear and make a choice not to listen. It is possible to hear and put it off as something just simply good information. How many people would think that, believe that, Service is important. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think. Service is important. So my next question, what are you doing about it? Because if it's important, if you believe it, what are you doing about it? If that's something that you think that's necessary for your children, how are you intentionally putting it into your family plan? What's a family plan? The plan that you have, the vision that you have for your children. I love the fact that you had visioning boards. What if every church and every family in our church had a visioning board? What if service, as we understand it as a core value, was included on that family board? What if dad or mom was intentional about saying, where am I taking my children to serve this week? What if you yourself were just saying, where am I taking me to serve this week? Where is it that I can share God's love in a powerful and meaningful way? You know, when we talk about these things, we talked about habits and what it takes to make a habit. Miss Wanda, how many days does it take to make a habit? 21 days to make a habit. We need to start developing habits that align with the will of God for our lives. Because the moment that you accept those habits, we're going to see a blessing from God that we have never seen before. Now, and like I said, they're dumbfounded. These believers, these people who were doing all this stuff, who were serving their community, who were, you know, feeding the homeless, who were reaching out when they were naked and clothed them. When they were in prison, they, 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 they came to them. When they were sick, they visited them. They're dumbfounded. Because it's like, when did this happen? When did this occur? They don't even understand because they were doing it out of something that was part of who they were. It wasn't a separate action, but rather it was part of their everyday life. And they just, they, they thought, what, what are you talking about? And Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. 
He's saying, when you served others, when you showed grace and mercy and compassion, that's when you did it. Amen. Let's read on. It says, and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did to one of the least of, the, uh, of, the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You know, there's an incredible blessing that comes from helping people. There's an incredible blessing. And most of the time, it's not for the person being helped. It's for you. You know, when we serve, we get to see God work. You know what? I like to serve just to see what God's going to do. Because I know what God is capable of doing. But I love to be able to say, you know what? Let me tell you the story about what God did. Let me show you where God did, because I've seen God work incredibly. I like to be able to say, let me show you where God's working. You don't believe that God's here? Let me tell you about what I know. Let me tell you about the Jesus that I know. Then it says this. This sounds great, right? I wish I could put a but here. Because there's a transition that's about to occur in this passage. Like I said, being a sheep, being on the right hand is where you want to be. But now we have to talk about the left hand. And a goat. And it says this. It says, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me. You cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. You know, it's interesting. We're about to see their reaction. And here's what's interesting. The reaction is almost the same. The reaction is almost the same. They're both dumbfounded when somebody says this. But for two different reasons. One, because they were doing it. And they didn't even know it because it was part of who they were and what God called them to do. The second group wasn't doing it. And the reason why they were dumbfounded was because they were oblivious to it. Anybody ever been oblivious? Nobody wants to raise their hand on that one. I have been oblivious in my life before. I have had things happen in front of me. My wife has said to me, did you see what happened? Nope. How did you not see? It was right there in front of you. I don't know. Anybody ever heard that from their husband? We can be oblivious to what's happening around us. We can even think that we're doing the things that we're supposed to do. We can even think, we can, we can make ourselves believe almost anything that we want us to believe. And so what happens is when Jesus said, when I was naked and you didn't give me any clothes, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me, when I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink, they're sitting there going, what are you talking about? When did that happen? If I asked you, do you think, would you give Jesus the shirt off your back if he needed it? I think everybody here would say yes. If he needed food, would you give it to him? Yeah, absolutely. Water? Absolutely. Nothing would stop me from doing that. So again, they had become so focused. That both of these people, they, they were upset when, the, the, the second group was upset when Jesus said, you didn't do these things because they're like, when? I, I would have done that. I would have, I would have taken care of that if, if, if I had known, if you had needed you know, anything, I would have given it to you. What, what are you talking about? The difference 
is this DNA of serving other people. The difference is understanding that we're called to a ministry of reconciliation. That we're called to bring people to Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to do the work. Let's, let's, not get that, let's not get that wrong. Because only Jesus can convict the heart. Only Jesus can change somebody. Only Jesus can give someone salvation. But you and I can point people in the right direction. You and I can lead people to the cross. You and I can serve people and when they ask why, tell them that it's because of what Jesus did for you and I. But again, understand that it is the Holy Spirit that will work in their heart which will convict them of sin. It is the Holy Spirit that will work them in their heart and give them the power over sin. It is the Holy Spirit that will lead people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our job is to point them in the direction the Holy Spirit will lead them and that Jesus will bring them closer to the cross. But at the same time, the Bible says, then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You know, as we talk about these things, as we're closing today, we have to understand that these are things that God has called us to do. Church isn't just about sitting here, hearing a good message, and doing nothing about it. The church is built and designed to be an agency for God in this world. Each one of you represent Jesus in this community. Each one of you are called to a mission and a purpose. It is not by chance that you are here this morning. Jesus wanted you to understand that you are called to serve the city of Jacksonville. And guess what? It should be part of your life. It should become part of your DNA. How do I do that? Well, guess what? It starts with day one. How do you build a new habit? You choose and you set in your mind that I'm going to do this. Guess what happens after day one? Day two, I do the same thing that I did in day one again and again and again and again. Do it intentionally until you don't even have to think about doing it. When you see someone in need, figure out how can I meet that need? Whether it's the person on the side of the road, whether it be the person, well, pastor, don't you know that those people are swindlers and this, that and the other? You know what? Here's what I've learned. My God is big enough to take care of that. If they're swindling me, guess what? I got swindled. God's going to bless me for what I'm doing, and he'll take care of them if they're doing something else. There is nothing I have to worry about. But here's the thing. The moment that I choose to serve people, when I choose to love people, I begin to see everyone, as Mrs. White put it, as someone who has eternal possibilities. Each and every single person that walks in your path has an eternal possibility. God wants to love that person to a relationship with him. And it starts with you. You know, one of the scariest comments I ever heard in my life is you might be the only Jesus that somebody ever sees. Let me say that again. You might be the only Jesus that somebody ever sees. Does that scare you? It scares me. Why? Because I want to make sure that everybody I come in contact with understands God's grace, his mercy, his compassion, and his love. At the same time, that God calls us to hold a standard too. Don't say I'm saying, well, no, we just, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't ask anybody to follow a standard or the rules or anything. Because God is love. Is he not? But at the same time, does God not call us to obedience? So again, we have this, we have this, this situation where we have to show love and compassion. But guess what? The only way to be obedient is when you have the power of the Holy Spirit living within you. There's something that we do that drives me insane. 
We ask people to transform their lives or conform their lives to the Word of God without giving them the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. That's an impossible task. Asking somebody to change before the Holy Spirit is in them is impossible. That's like asking me to fly. Just not going to happen. I can do it once. After that once, I've got a problem. But we have to have in us as a church, as a family, and as a person, the DNA of service. Because we are called to serve other people. You know, there are a lot of churches all over the United States that don't serve their community. Somebody once asked me the question, is if your, commu- if your church was to shut its doors, would your community know that you disappeared? Now, not the people who go to church here, not the people sitting in the pews, because of course, if I shut the church down, you would notice. I would hope you would. When you came to the door, there was nobody here, the lights were off, the building was locked up, you would notice. But the question is, would your community notice? You know, I will tell you, when I first came to this church, my answer would have been, probably not. Most people did not know that this church even existed. Because we have a little black sign by the road. Anybody ever seen the sign out on Belfort? It's about that big. Okay? That's what most people knew. If they knew, they knew the building because it's an odd-shaped building. That's what they know about it. But I will tell you, over the last period of time, with our community service and with our pantry, thousands of people come through our doors every single week. People find Jesus in this building on a regular basis. And so guess what? My answer to this question, would your community notice? Absolutely. They would notice if we disappeared. We're doing better. But we can always be better. We can always do better. I would say right now we have about 25% of our population are our membership serving on a regular basis. Could you imagine what God did, what God could do with 75? Could you imagine what God could do with 50? If God's people align their will to the will of God, God wants to do incredible things. He wants to do things we've never even seen before. You know, I think of what God says about heaven. I have not seen nor ear heard the things which God has in store for us. I think that applies here on earth too. I don't think that we know what God could do with South Point right now. I don't think we could even imagine it because if you had asked the people three years ago, what could God do? I don't think they'd tell you what we're doing yesterday. I think that would be too far down the road. But what could God be doing three years from now if we chose to align our will to the will of God? So this morning, my challenge is this. Make service part of your DNA. Make service part of your children's DNA. Invest heavily in your children. Because what you do now matters more than anything else that you will do. Invest early, invest smartly, and understand that God will bless because of it. I'm going to invite our praise team to come forward as we have our closing song today.
total praise is her closing song. never too late to say, you know what, I need to add something to who I am and what God has called us. The only difference that matters is how heavily you have to invest in it for it to make a difference. If your children are young, invest in it immediately. 
If your children are older, invest in it immediately heavily because it matters to God. It matters to their future. And it matters to who God is calling each of us to be. Find some way to serve this week. Find someone to love on. So find someone to share God's grace with, with an, in a powerful and meaningful way. Because all praise belongs to Him. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful. We lift our hands in praise to You because You are God. Father, you have called us to serve one another, to love one another with the type of love that you had for each of us. Father, may we never forget that you have first loved me. And that because of that love and that, that, that compassion and that grace for me, I can share with others what God has done. Father, may we never forget that it started with us, that you loved us before we even loved you. Father, that you sent your son to die for each of us so that we could have eternal life. But Father, may it just not be something that we believe, but something that motivates us to do something about it. That grace, that compassion, that mercy is what this world desperately needs. Father, may we be your agents for change, Lord. Father, may we lead people to the cross and close to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.